It's not shuffle. Oh, Jessica, I wish you had yours now. So we'll do it, yeah. You know, I'm just muting my main PC. There we go. We've gone live. Oh, look, it's me. Let's see how many people <laughs> that we're here. I was trying to get the comments up. There we go. Past Jessica just said channel four. Channel four? <laughs> Oh, because it's yeah. Because she said it's we're live. Do not swear. Because it's we're live on channel four. Please oh, do not yeah. swear. Oh. Which was um ah Big Brother. Yeah. Yeah. Twelve people here already. Oh, you're eager beavers. One's me. So oh. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and Harry. One's me. Harry. I have so many head. friends. They're all just me. Just all <laughs> <laughs> They're all just me. Harry in the comments, oh, on time, well, I never, that's what I like to see. Rude. Rude. Wait, I can't see any comments. I feel like an old person. No? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see any comments. Oh, either. I've got it now. It's okay. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do a proper little intro in a second. Like I so I usually just sit here for um, like a minute and just see if people um, turn up. We've hi, Amanda. People. Amanda said hi. Oh, yeah. Hey, Amanda. Anybody else want to say hi? Just while we're sitting, stimming. If I look over my, it's up over there. My comments, in case you're wondering. No, my, I know my my comments are here. <laughs> Whereas you, just, but I just pretend and just pick a random spot to like stare off into <laughs> every so often. <laughs> I don't have any comments. <laughs> it's, there's only two. You're fine. <laughs> oh no, no, not Zoom, Annette. We're at, we're looking at it on Facebook. Oh. Facebook live comments. I know, but I can't figure out how to look at the live comments. Oh, I don't understand. That's what I thought. If you click, if you go into lives and then you actually click on the screen where you can see us like chatting, will need then to it will open it properly. Oh, and as soon as it yeah. opens it, you'll need to turn the sound off. Oh, yes. yeah. 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 Hi, Jenny. Oh, cool. I don't know. It doubled since I looked last. Lovely. Hello, Samara. Oh, great. Okay. <gasps> ah, Annette. What? I just got rid of it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll, I'll look at the comments. I'm section. an old person. It's fine. I'll look at the comments section. Okay. Hi, everybody um, who's here. Um, 24 of you already. That's lovely for a Friday, considering we don't usually do this um, on a Friday anyway. Um, for those of you who are potentially new, I am Dr. Chloe Farahar of Orcademy. And Orcademy, if you're not aware, is an educative platform um, where we educate about autistic experience from only autistic or otherwise neurodivergent people. And today we are discussing disclosing um, your autistic identity and sort of the things that go into that, some of the difficulties, whether you whether it's a good thing, whether it's a, a difficult thing, whether you should do it or not. Um, and specifically, I've got um, Jessica Trudasama Alloway, who is me. of Academy and does a million and one things. Um, and we've got Annette Foster, who is also a member of Academy, but she's kind of behind the scenes a lot at the moment because she's trying to finish her PhD, which we can discuss. I'm going to ask in a second, actually, <laughs> what your PhD is about. Okay. Um, but the reason it's quite nice that we're doing this, so we've got two sessions based on disclosing one's autistic identity. So we're doing the one today with Jessica and Annette because we're also talking about the similarities of disclosing a concealable identity, such as being autistic, because you can mask and hide as an autistic person your autistic experience, um, and how that can be potentially similar to your gender or sexual identity identity because both um, Annette and Jessica identify as queer so we're just going to kind of see how there's a lot of intersectionality there um, and I love how I've already mentioned masking quite early on and Kieran Rose is in the comment section mm. <laughs> hi Kieran oh and Kieran says hi Annette long time no see which is lovely did you see how I corrected you to Dr Potato Thank you, Harry. <laughs> um, so lovely. I'm, I might not pay too much attention to the comment section um, for a while because it gets a bit distracting and because I've got two deck guests today, um, I've got to use all my spoons and potentially some sporks. Um, but Harry is in the comment section today, so he will be um, 
uh, herding you lot and um, potentially pinning some comments for us so that we might pick up on them. Um, okay, so Annette, because Annette has been on before talking about being an artist yes. um, and being an autistic artist, but do you want to quickly tell people what your PhD is in? I guess who you are. Okay. <laughs> we'll start with that. We'll start with that. Okay, so um, I am... I. I am an artist and I have been an artist uh, for over 20 years. Um, I'm a visual and performance artist. I say I kind of so say I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I, I also am autistic. I was um, discovered autistic at 39 years old. And that kind of took me on a completely different path. Um, I had been working as an artist um, most of my life and my adult life and realized that I wanted to do something to help other autistic people um, with, with my talent, with my special skills, <laughs> which is being an artist, I suppose. And I ended up starting to do a PhD um, looking at women, non-binary and trans people's experience of being autistic um, through visual and performing arts. And basically what I did was work with a group of uh, women, non-binary and trans people as par part of the University of Kent, um, doing workshops, really trying to understand um, what our experience was as autistic people um, sensorily, um, you know, ultimately, I think we kind of discovered what autistic space was. There's lots of things that we discovered um, along the way. And I learned immensely from the people that I work with. Um, I also created a, a solo piece of work as part of the PhD called um, Adventures of Super Auti Girl, uh, which I performed at um, the Autism Arts Festival. And then after the workshops, I got some lovely people that were a part of the workshops to perform with me in Adventures of Super Auti Gang. Um, and both of these were a celebration of being autistic basically, um, and kind of really trying to be true, even as a performer um, to my autistic self. Um, so trying not to mask in the performance and, and asking the people that were part of it, which Jessica and Chloe were, <laughs> um, to be their true artistic selves as well, um, and to celebrate that as part of the work. That was very fun. Yes. Um, <laughs> and Jessica, is it too much to put you on the spot and say, who are you, Jessica? What do you do? You can, but there's not a lot to tell. There's loads um, to tell. Okay, I'm Jessica, and I'm a Jessica. No, um, and I did a degree in psychology with clinical psychology, and I'm hoping to go into a master's in um, child protection. I currently work with Chloe and Harry and lots of other lovely people. Um, lots of you know me as Harry or Laura's PA. I do a lot of work in the emails being comment fairy um, and also sort of some content with Academy as well. Lovely. Okay, so I guess starting off is in terms of talking about autistic identity and disclosing one's autistic identity. Um, and the reason this is quite an important and interesting conversation to be having is like I say, for a number of us, not necessarily all of us, but a number of us, we can conceal our autistic identity. And like I say, this would be um, by, via things like masking. So um, hiding um, unconsciously largely your autisticness so the things that make you stand out and make you different um so before for me um understanding and discovering that i was autistic um i'd always wanted to shave my head but i never had so then you know that was part of a mask that got dropped um and now doing things like stimming when you need to um one of my favorite objects at the moment um and so it's quite an interesting thing to have a concealable um, identity that's quite important to you that because it shapes all of how you experience the world um, and so I guess I think it would be quite interesting to start off by asking each of us to just explain how we first disclosed and what that experience was like 
I think if I get mine out of the way, because then I want to concentrate on both of yours and I can pick up on some points and ask you questions based on yours, if that's all right. Um, so in terms of mine, I was diagnosed at um, 32. I discovered or realized that I was autistic about a year before that. Um, and it was, it was quite easy. It was relatively easy to disclose to my very, very small family, because my family's very tiny, um, that I was autistic um, without any real concern because our family's always been a bit odd, if you like, or, or weird. So that wasn't a disclosure. There wasn't a big thing there for me. But in terms of sort of the rest of the world, it was it was different, I guess. And I made some interesting or potentially interesting decisions about how to disclose to people. Um, so in terms of people who I was close to and friends, um, you know, very close friends, they already knew because I would have discussed before even diagnosis that I thought I was autistic and had conversations with them. So that again, wasn't necessarily an issue uh, or something I was concerned about in terms of telling them. Um, Potentially a couple of them were like, I don't see it or I don't think you are. And, and then a little bit of a conversation later, they're like, oh, OK, yeah, I get it. You know, there was no weirdness or rudeness or or anything like that. Um, then I decided to do a very small, closed Facebook group for a slightly larger number of people that I was potentially acquaintances with or friends with. But, you know, they weren't my my close, close friends. Like I had loads of close friends, like <laughs> like two. Um, so yeah, so I did that there just to let people in on it and just ask them if they wanted to ask me any questions or anything like that. So that was in a closed Facebook group. So again, I think I kind of did it that way because it reduced the number of one-to-one face-to-face conversations I would have had to have about it. There was like a bar- there was like a there was a boundary and there was a distance between me telling those people and them potentially responding and you know if it went badly I guess um, I could just block them for instance I don't know I I didn't really think that far ahead I don't think Um, and then once I'd got that out the way I made the decision to tell the rest of my school of psychology um, via um, so every year for PhD students you have to present where you're at with your PhD Um, and so that year I decided at the beginning of my presentation on my research to disclose to the school who were all, you know, some academics and lecturers and and things in front of me um, and other peers that I was autistic. And I think, again, that's actually a more comfortable um, place for me to be because I actually enjoy giving presentations, as everybody knows. Um, I love a presentation. I love a PowerPoint um, because there's that distance. I'm in control. I get to script what I want to say. I literally scripted how I was going to disclose that I was autistic um and there was that um distance between the people in front of me because there was going to be another presentation after me it's not like they could pull me aside and and disrupt it and ask me questions so that so it was almost yeah this sort of staged way um and getting everybody out of the way in one go so that was my kind of odd potentially unusual way of disclosing to a large group of people that I was autistic um in terms of how that went largely like I say it was largely positive um I actually told my supervisors face to face individually before I disclosed to the whole school because I thought that was a bit more appropriate um and they were fine they there was no no weirdness no treating me differently um or anything like that um and there's been an odd occasion where I felt that potentially I was suddenly being spoken to more like I was slightly more childlike I was infantilized slightly by a small number of people in in my interactions potentially at the university and things like that but we can talk about that as we go along in terms of you guys so I'm going to get a piece of paper because I do this and I make my notes as I'm listening so um I think if we start with Annette because Annette your disclosure would have been at a very different time because yeah yeah when well, okay. Explain it terrified. How long ago you disclosed your autism? Wasn't that long ago? God, I'm not that old. Jeez. No, but mine. No, but my point being, mine's like um, what four or five, four or so years. Yeah. So, um, I think it. I think it was 2011. I think it's been nine years. Is that right? 
I think so. Yeah, it's been quite a while because I my marriage broke up in 2013. So yeah, I think it was a couple of years before. Um, yeah, so I, I, in some ways, I didn't discover I was autistic. It was um, something that I pushed through my GP constantly um, that, you know, I suffered from depression and anxiety and all sorts of social anxiety disorder and bi supposedly I was bipolar, all these things. And I just kept going back saying, you know, I'm still suffering. Why is this happening? Um, why do I keep going into bouts of depression? Why do I keep having so much anxiety in my life? And I finally, after about 10 years of pushing, um, I spoke to, I always get this messed up, a psychologist. And I explained my situation and they said, you know what? Everything that you're describing sounds like, that it sounds like autism. That's what they said at the time. And I said, really? No, I don't think so. Um, and then I decided to go uh, take the test and I scored, I don't know, in, in the high 30s on the typical AQ test. And basically I went to be, uh, to try to be diagnosed and the psychologist there didn't think that I was autistic. Um, but by the time we went through the whole process, we were both very convinced that I was. Um, and it was a massive revelation for me and totally changed my life. I mean, I, you know, you talk about being a baby autistic, like you're crawling around as soon as you um, discover that you're autistic and like you have to relearn how to be a person again so, or be your, your authentic self um, because I'd been masking my whole life and I wasn't even aware that I'd been masking. So, you know, that was a huge process for me. But I also am an artist and a performance artist. So I really felt quite strongly that I wanted to come out as autistic um, quite quickly after I was diagnosed. Um, and I guess I was a little bit naive about that to a certain extent, because I just told everyone. Um, and one of the first things that I did was create a sign that said autistic and go out onto a street and um, just stand there um, on the street with a sign that said autistic. And my friend filmed the process. I, I, it was on a very busy street. I, I remember it was on Black Friday in Nottingham um, in the pedestrianized area. So there was loads of people walking past and I wanted that kind of isolation within a massive group of people. I, I didn't realize that nobody would come up to me or ask me any questions or even actually, people would stare at me a bit, but they, most of them just walked past just completely ignored me, um, which was how I felt. I suppose why I did that was because I had felt that I had been invisible, even to myself, um, and that I, want, I didn't want to be invisible anymore. And I wanted people to see that I was autistic and I was just me and I wasn't the stereotypes. Um, and yeah, I did a series of kind of works doing that. I did it in Canterbury as well. And it became part of uh, Super Aughty Girl as kind of the first action um, of that. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess for me, I, I, there's lots of good things about being open and being autistic. I mean, most of the things that happened in my life have been because I disclosed that I was autistic. I ended up doing a PhD um, and, and been, um, been able to make amazing work and work with amazing people because I've got a cat who wants to come and stand on the keyboard. So, so cute. Uh, Ted. Hello, Ted. Um, but at the beginning, it was, it was quite hard. Um, I disclosed to a lot of people um, in the art world that I was autistic and, and that I wanted to make a piece of artwork about being autistic and I, which I was really excited about and just like, yes, I wanna do this, you know? Um, 
and I got some really, really negative reactions. This was 2011. Um, I remember one person saying, why would you make, want to make a piece of artwork about that? As if it, you know, it was a disease and it was a negative thing and, and why would you want to ever do anything like It was really not a nice thing. I had lots of people tell me I wasn't autistic, just to my face. Uh, somebody who supposedly was a PhD student in, in autism studies at the time who after speaking to me for two minutes said I wasn't autistic and my diagnosis was not valid um, and that they had gotten it wrong. Um, so that was tough. Um, my family didn't really, it took a while. I think after talking to my family for the last 10 years, they're like, oh yeah, you're autistic. Um, but it did take a long time for them to accept it. Um, and ultimately, my partner and I uh, ended up at the time we got a divorce and ultimately I think it, in some ways it was because I wouldn't mask my autisticness anymore. And um, my partner at the time, she just said, why can't you go to the pub? Why you used to be able to do these things? Why can't you do them now? And I just, I just, I couldn't be the person that she wanted me to be anymore. Um, but ultimately that's been a good thing. And I have a new partner now who knew I was autistic from the second they met me um, and um, accepts me for who I am. Um, you know, I would never take back coming out as autistic. I think it's been ultimately a really positive thing in my life and, and helped me to accept myself for who I am um, for the first time. So. Lovely. Thank you. I've made loads of little notes. So I'm thinking we'll, we'll come back to these different things that I'm hearing and that I think are quite useful. Um, and so Jessica, because obviously yours is much newer, your, well, your diagnosis is very new. Mm. I don't know if your personal discovery is that new. No, so it would have been probably four years ago, I think was when I talked to my disability advisor. Yes, Jessica, carry on talking. Okay, so <laughs> um, <laughs> so my family and I, so we've always been interested in education and that kind of thing. I remember as a really nerdy student in like year 10 or 11, we could do a project about anything and my friend did about dragons and I did about the effects of different educational systems on the emotional well-being of students. And um, so we've always been really interested in it. And um that's how my family and I got joking for a while that we were autistic, not joking about autistic people or anything like that, but we thought um, very like ignorantly that if we could mask, the mask was the real us and like the autistic us was like just not trying hard enough. And it was us like having some time off from being a real human. Um, I don't know why, <laughs> it's, it's really stupid now. Um, but when I was seeing my disability advisor, cause I was saying about how um I was struggling to like get on with people just they weren't my kind of people and um with depression anxiety and um they said that you know you might be autistic because I said I've been joking about it and she was like no that's genuinely autistic and I was like okay and I sort of played along with her <laughs> and I still kept going along this thing of I'm just pretending to be autistic and it wasn't until I went to the social group and um was sort of met everyone there like Chloe and Annette and everyone I was like oh no you're right I I am autistic okay this is fine and um when I told my family they did the same thing that I'd done so for several weeks they thought of sort of thought my joking had gone too far <laughs> and they were like yeah you're yeah mm -hmm, you're totally autistic um and they did the same for themselves until we all kind of accepted that we're autistic and then it wasn't until I'd done the SYA program that it changed from like accepting that I was autistic to actually being really pleased and proud that I was autistic um and that was maybe a year after or so yeah um anything else Chloe <laughs> yeah so that's you discovering so then I guess it's about disclosing so how Discl were the different disclosing experiences and and who to and whatnot yeah so like I said to like my close family I obviously I they were there every step of it because 
it was like a running joke to us um because we i i think it's because we'd internalized kind of the problems that we've been having in life and thought it's just us not trying hard enough rather than we actually ha we're like actually autistic we have this thing that um makes life difficult i don't know um so disclosing to them was kind of like a big joke at first i didn't realize that i was seriously saying as autistic um so that was actually quite easy because as it went on we all sort of realized together but other people i don't know it was quite hard there was a lot of friends and stuff that i would um you could say oh i don't really want to do that because i have anxiety and they'd be like oh yeah that's fine and then i would say sort of like well actually i'm not just anxious i'm autistic and that's why um i'm anxious about that and they'll sort of go you look like you have social skills and then start treating you differently and that was really hard and you had to sort of weed out who your friends are which is why i have a lot more autistic friends than i do non-autistic friends um yeah and then why do family members i like to casually drop it into conversation like it's not a big deal because i don't think coming out as anything should be a big deal people should just sort of accept you for who you are so i remember when i saw them it was probably at christmas or something like that and um we were just chatting about i think ehlers danlos syndrome because they're they can be linked and i was like oh yeah what you're doing with your feet there that's not normal that's quite eds um and then we were talking we were like oh you might be autistic too and they were like really there's no one in the family like yeah i'm autistic and they're like oh okay, okay but because i acted like it was really normal and everyone knew they kind of had to play along with the fact that it wasn't strange um i quite like doing it that way that's probably the best <laughs> oh, definitely oh yeah and my, and my best friend she she um when i first met her she'd been saying that her younger brother was autistic but i could see in her that she was autistic because i very much knew i was autistic at this point and i was like mm -hmm, your younger brother and he is <laughs> um <laughs> but then as it went along i think because i'm so accepting of it she was like oh yeah i'm autistic too and i was like me too high five okay we've got that out of the way now we can just carry on <laughs> And those sorts of experiences are quite interesting and nice and fun and just reaffirming, aren't they? That when you do meet somebody who doesn't know you're autistic or just literally a brand new person, which which in itself is is quite difficult for us. Um, and you're kind of like, oh, yeah, that I'm autistic and their response is positive or, you know, and, and that's really it's sad for us that that's a win. Like mm. it should be the norm. But I think about there was this lovely guy who came, I was selling a few bits and pieces on, um, I call it Face Bay, but. Um, uh, Facebook Marketplace. Yes, Facebook Marketplace. And I was just selling some bits and pieces and he came to pick up some speakers for his autistic employee who loved listening to music all day. And I was like, oh, you love, that's really, really lovely that you're considering his needs in the workplace and all. And he's like, oh yeah, he's because he's listening to the music at the tinny laptop and it's awful and, and so I'm getting these and I'm like oh that's great so we had a conversation and I'm like yeah I'm autistic and my partner and he just looked at me and was like um what was it it's like oh oh that's great or something like that and I was like yeah and he was like I mean I was like no no that's fine like yeah. that was his immediate response which was a nice positive reaffirming there was no um really I don't see it or you know none of nothing like that it was just this really lovely I acknowledge what you say I see it as a positive because it was that's oh that's great you know kind of thing um and it was just a really nice exchange um I haven't had very often people say to my face that they don't think I'm autistic so we've had we'll have this conversation I think because this is obviously something that a lot of people who are autistic who don't potentially have particularly complex or um, high support needs. So somebody without an intellectual disability, I don't like the term, but that's the term in the diagnostic manuals or a language impairment, we might be accused of not looking autistic or you can't be autistic, or I know somebody's autistic and you're nothing like that mm -hmm. autistic person. Now I don't get this. Now I, you know, I'm very openly autistic. Pretty much everyone who ever meets me must be told by me at some point that I'm autistic. And the only person I can think of is one academic. And I don't think he was necessarily being rude, but he, you know, was asking some advice about something, a lecture that he was giving. And I explained something and he said, oh, what makes you think you're autistic? 
and I kind of got thrown by the question because this was after oh, yeah. a while of being quite openly oh, autistic. Yeah. I thought everybody knew. And um, I kind of didn't know how to respond. So I just went, because I have a diagnosis. Now that's not, you know, we're very much, you don't need a diagnosis because we're very anti-pathology on academy. Mm. And as a small group um, on here, I know we all agree that we don't see it as a pathology. So it is just about discovering your autistic identity. Um, but I didn't know how else to respond because I never get that question. And I remember in UOKA, we were having, uh, sorry, that's the University of Kent Autistics Group that Annette and I run and um, Jessica's um, been part of for a few years as well. And we were in a group and we were talking about people's experiences of that being questioned on your autistic identity. And I gave my, um, oh, I don't get that. People don't say that about me. And I remember one of our lovely students taking their um, noise cancelling headphones off, just sort of looking at me and going, I think that's because you're quite intimidating and then put them back on <laughs> and it um, and they weren't being rude it was nothing like that it was just yeah. it was amusing it, it was like oh. maybe that's why or maybe I'm just clearly autistic I don't know no. um but what about you both so you've Annette you said you've had yeah I mean I it's a lot more in the past although even probably 2015 I mean I've had people say you know, all the things that a lot of people probably have heard before, like, oh, well, you're autistic, but, but you're high functioning, so you're all right. Or, you know, you're, you know, that kind of thing as if, um, you know, well, you function very well. So, you know, um, I, I definitely have had that. Um, I think sadly, that's, that's almost like them trying to make you feel better yeah it's almost like they think it's a positive thing as if we yeah. think we're we must have low self-esteem on the basis of being autistic or yeah. having autism which yeah. is obviously not how we understand our autistic experience um so I think that's what they mean and it's quite difficult to try and get them to, to understand you don't need to do that you yeah. literally need to acknowledge it potentially yeah. ask if there's anything support wise or what do they need to understand yeah so it's it's interesting I mean, I mean in 2011 I did feel like I was a bit ostracized by the art world within the performance and live art community because I had come out as autistic and said I was going to make work about it um, but that's kind of that has changed I think to a certain extent but probably not completely um, I kind of tend to when things like that happen I kind of I've I've not been in the art world since I started my PhD which is 2015 so I kind of feel a little bit out of that but there's definitely um you know people have supported my work and and liked what I do within the art world but yeah it's interesting um and I know that other artists sometimes don't want to be seen as an autistic artist they want to be seen as an artist who happens to be autistic um I don't know I mean I'm, I'm very much an autistic person so that is important to me um but I'm also very much an artist can't they just be equal I don't know it's it, I think it's every it, it, it's definitely a choice um to come out I think not everybody feels comfortable doing it and that's totally okay um and you know different worlds are you know we're in a very privileged position being at a university and um, having a community of autistic people around us I think it's much more difficult when you're on your own um, and we're very much aware of other privileges that we have too so yes we are a neuro minority so we are um, oppressed and experienced discrimination and what have you but all three of us are white mm -hmm. um, you know again we don't um, particularly have language disability or anything like that so we are in a privileged position um, in that sense I'm just wondering I want to ask Jessica actually first before I go on to my point which is about how do we respond to the dismissal that we might receive but I want to find out from Jessica have have you been dismissed um, or any other instances yeah so um, uh, around the time that I was supposed to be going for a diagnosis, which it took about a year and a half to get going. So I was very adamant that I was autistic at this point. I was dealing with a lot of um, psychologists and therapists and 
psychiatrists, um, some social workers, and all of them, their question was, why do you think you're autistic? And I was like, because I am, <laughs> like, I don't know. And um, I was like, well, why do you think you're not autistic? And then they'd get really offended. They'd be like, well, I don't have deficits in this and I don't have deficits in that. And I was like, okay, you being really offended that I'm asking why you think you're not autistic. That's why I'm offended when you ask me why I think I'm autistic because you want me to um, lay out everything I struggle with or um, lay out a picture of very typical like male autism, you know, like I really like trains. That would be the correct answer, but I couldn't give my real answers, if that makes sense. And I was asked it over and over and over again um, until I did get diagnosed. And then my um, psychologist said, who was meant to be working with me, I didn't really like her. Um, she said, how do you feel now that you have your diagnosis? And I was like, fine, exactly the same as I did before I had it. And she obviously wanted me to have more of a struggle with it. And I was like, I don't understand your point. Um, and she was like, you know, do you think people are going to see you differently? Or why did you want to be diagnosed? And I was like, specifically to shove it in people's faces like you, so that you don't ask me that dreaded question of why do I think I'm autistic? I can just give you this and be like, look, I am autistic. That's the only reason <laughs> for it. <laughs> so now, because this is something that I think a lot of people struggle with and potentially want some sign or understanding about how they can respond, which is how do we respond? to our, the dismissal of our autisticness. So I was just listening, I'm just thinking, I mean, potentially, is it just as simple as just saying, you can dismiss it as much as you like, I'm still autistic. And just mm. trying to have that, which many of us will struggle with and may take time, but having that sort of confidence, we know we're autistic, you know, our whole life, sensory social and emotional world is colored by our autistic experience mm. so be confident enough that when you're confronted with that dismissal that you can say that i am autistic perspective doesn't yeah. change that i am autistic and yeah. leave it because I think we shouldn't have to defend ourselves over and over and over again. That's like, I mean, to a certain extent, it's like asking some me, why do you think you're bisexual? Yeah, it's, it's you know, obvious answer, isn't it? <laughs> I'm like, I'm bisexual. Yeah, <laughs> you can't tell me I'm not bisexual. <laughs> And that mm. is so good at stepping on my next question. Sorry. <laughs> I, love it. I love it though because this the is why the conversation let... flows, right? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> I love it because I'll be doing like a presentation and then I'll be talking about my slide that's like three slides along and I'm like, oh, there's a slide in three slides. I'm an improviser. I you just are. go with it. I know. I love it. This is why it's great. Um, okay. Have we got any other potential responses to where well, you don't look autistic? or why do you think you're autistic, or what makes you autistic? So other than... I, I like Jessica's. Yeah, I always know, try and flip it around, like however they yeah. phrased it, I'll why do it do straight back. Why do you think back. you're not autistic? Yeah, or you don't look autistic, I'd be like, well, you don't look not autistic. Um, yeah. <laughs> or you look like you have good social skills, and I'm like, you look like you have good social skills? Like, <laughs> really questioning their social skills. Um, I think it's perfectly fair because I don't think I've ever done it to somebody who hasn't got offended and it really gives them a taste of their own medicine because they don't ask it thinking that they're being offensive but then as soon as you ask it back they're really offended um, mm. and it does kind of show them that it's not an okay question to ask. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I think at one point because of the number of trainings that I've done across the years when I started doing specifically autism training um, I always like to come up with quite um, salient examples and things like that because people who are not not autistic really struggle they don't think they do but they they feel that they understand when you explain something to them about autistic experience they think they know what what it means and they actually don't mm. so um i like to come up with examples and so one, one of my examples um uh oh no i've lost my train of thought doesn't matter about that one but the one i'm thinking of <laughs> is at one point I wanted to do something when it was relating to talking to them about stigma and autism is as they all come through the room, ask all of them, are you autistic? And mm. see what the kinds of responses are. 
um, and not say anything about it, but then later just say, you know, when you were asked that, I want you to really investigate how you felt when you were asked that question. If you were offended, I want you to ask yourself why. What is offensive about being autistic and getting people to really investigate actually they've probably got a very pathologized very negative mm. understanding about autistic experience um okay so because you what, did you did that in the show didn't you super archie gang you asked people if they were autistic before they as came they came in, in. Mm. Yeah. yeah 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 and then you um, gave them a sticker yeah i mean that was quite interesting and quite fun too but but because they were all there for an autism show um you know they were but there was no there didn't seem to be anyone who took it that was so funny though because they would be like oh no I'm not autistic like really sad that they weren't because we were yeah. this gang of really cool <laughs> autistic people as if we were going to shun them for not being autistic yeah <laughs> you can't come in great yeah I'm trying to remember yeah. you phrase it as are you neurotypical or, or I don't feel like we asked yes you autistic. yeah you you so said I, it the opposite way around yeah yeah I said I think I asked are you neurotypical they would respond if they responded yes I would be like Oh. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> have a sticker um, yeah <laughs> just to be clear for everybody who's watching that the point was to yeah it was to make a point and it was a very dramatic point yeah it wasn't how it wasn't just cruel people it was generally yes the show, um, and part of the show okay so I think I quite like these two then so are we sticking with so Jessica so so really you think why do you think you're autistic are you autistic how are you going to respond yeah um would always be like why do you think you're not autistic yeah or, okay yeah, normally the exact phrasing yeah I like that why do you think you're not autistic yeah okay there's, there's invariably you know so many autistic people out there that haven't been that are a lost generation that they there's probably loads <laughs> I mean I love it when somebody says you know oh well a lot of people do that when you talk you're talking about being autistic and you know actually not everyone <laughs> but again yeah, again i i don't think that doesn't happen that often and when it does when somebody says to you yeah but we're all a bit autistic because i do this and i do that and you kind of look at them and go uh-huh you're, you're clearly autistic yeah <laughs> um we do have very good alti dar me and annette yeah actually, you're a green square <laughs> you're clearly autistic <laughs> well jessica has seen a thesis where she will um typically be able to identify a neurodivergent person by the shape and color i don't claim this this is just a pattern that chloe's known just just yeah <laughs> and, annette and i have it's definitely real. i remember annette me and you giving training and then at the end me going did you see the guy three rows back and then she's oh like, yeah he's autistic like yeah. Yeah, we can see you <laughs> we we recognize you and we see our kin it's lovely um awesome. Carrie, would you mind um pinning those two potential responses to why do you think you're autistic so mine um I need to remember what mine was. Oh no. Um, oh, is oh. Well, mine's more if they say, "Well, you don't look autistic," or you know, dismissing that you're autistic, not even asking um, why do you think you're autistic. More if they completely dismiss it. So mine would be, um, "That's your no. perspective, but it does not change that I am autistic." I am autistic, and then just yeah. leaving it because you don't. Yeah. You don't need to give your spoons to people. To just you don't say, need to argue with somebody and make excuses for why you're autistic. If you're autistic, you you know you're autistic. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to have reasons why. I know I, some people are just curious, but ultimately, like Jessica said, it's not really our job to teach people. And potentially what, we're only telling people so that they can potentially try and make accommodation or understand if we perhaps communicate in a, a, a different way or something like that. Um, I had to try and thought and lost it. Ah, I mean, I just wanted to make clear actually why we're talking about it as autistic identity. So there would be some argument from typically non-autistic people that it is not an identity, that it is um, disorder disease or so on and so forth um, and while I'm not going to go into the evidence that demonstrates that we are not uh, or that there's a lack of evidence that de demonstrates that we're disordered um, it's it's more about what does being autistic mean and it's not simply a matter of having an autism spectrum disorder you know everything that 
the way we interact with other human beings and the fact that we do have a way of interacting with other autistic people that we don't have with obviously non-autistic people you know it, it it is our identity and it's really important it's integral it gives us um positive self-esteem to connect to other people based on that identity whereas connecting or belonging to the group of people with autism there's no positive um connection there there's no positive reason to connect with other people but if it's we connect, isolating it's it's yeah to be to be a pathology to be a person with autism is incredibly isolating and really damages our well-being so the sort of way to combat that is to strongly identify as with a social identity that's meaningful up to us and that's autistic um, so whether people want to believe that we can have it as an identity or that we are a pathology is irrelevant and kind of moot in the face of knowing that having a strong positive social identity improves our well-being and that is so important for our community at the moment mm -hmm. um, given the levels of stigma and um suicidal ideation and suicide in our community sorry that's a really dark note but it's led to a positive thing which is connecting with other autistic people via an identity yes so what are the pitfalls of disclosing one's autistic identity so annette obviously you've mentioned that your marriage ended you yeah i have <laughs> argued that it's not entirely because of you know, no. recognizing your autistic and then being your authentic autistic self, but it potentially contributed to it. Yeah. I've lost um, pretty much all the neurotypical friends that I had um, because either I got to a point where I was like, I'm not actually going to put up with the way that you respond to me now that I know I'm autistic and it's not actually reciprocal friendship or you know that kind of thing or just a, a, a similar thing that being my authentic autistic self and demasking um led to being rejected by people mm. um and so that was it was and to a certain, yeah at a certain extent you kind of realizing okay these are not good people to have in my life i need people that are going to accept me for who i am mm. um so potentially losing friendships, um, relationships, like romantic relationships, um, is potentially there. Jessica, do you feel that you've experienced anything like that? So. Um, yeah. So with like losing friends, there's a, a lot of different like categories in my head. So there's different things. So there's people who you tell them you're autistic. Obviously, my autistic brain putting them in categories. Um, <laughs> you tell them you're autistic, and there's like a few people who will outright not want to be your friend, but they're I think a minority of the friends that you lose yeah. um, because there's other people who just, again, like Chloe was saying, they won't kind of make accommodations for you um, because they think you've coped with really distressing situations in the past. So you should put yourself through them again. And yeah. then I think there's a few friends who I was friends with before I realized that I was autistic and I've lost them just out of fear of not wanting to tell them I'm autistic because I don't want to, kind of taint their memory of me if that makes sense they're friends I had before university um mm. and it's just people I'm scared of telling which obviously if I told them if I went with ratios of how many I've told um some of them would be okay with it but in the other side I don't want them to change their view of me so I think I've lost friends that way and then also um sometimes people just don't give you a chance if you say you're autistic they automatically think of you differently so you don't have the opportunity to make those new friends who I think they're sort of friends that you've lost sort of before they've started if that makes sense mm. so we do there is that potential so we're not going to lie so we've had this conversation with um, the support program group um, today that potentially when you drop your mask you are likely to lose friends um, but potentially you're yeah. I know, I'm going to get to the positive don't worry I promise it's just we, we need to be honest about it we can't yeah. sugarcoat it that to disclose your autistic identity to demask and show your truly authentic autistic self potentially will mean that you lose certain people in your life but the important I think also the I was just going to say the pathologization of, of, of being autistic, you know, when I was diagnosed, okay, this is 2011, they referred to my partner as my care. Um, and that really scared my partner at the time that she didn't want to be a carer for me. Not that I needed a carer. 
Um, so that even the language that they used, and I, I don't know if they do that anymore. Um, but I kind of thought of it, well, I care for you, you care for me, we're carers. Just thinking, what about your you wedding know? vows? It depends on your wedding vows. I know. <laughs> sickness and health, although obviously we aren't sick, but yeah, interesting. Um, mm. So, but there is the upside to yes, it's, it's scary that you might potentially lose people, but the upside is you gain people and you gain mm -hmm. potentially and very likely the right people in your life. So yes, I've lost pretty much all the main non-autistic friends that I'd had mm -hmm. for quite a while. Um, and now I only have autistic friends um, and they are good true friends we're authentic around one another I say this it's you two and you know Harry <laughs> and like a, a very but you all you also yeah. gain yourself you gain yeah. your autistic, authentic self you you gain this person that you have pushed down inside of you your whole life this person that you didn't think was good enough you know to show to the world um and you get to show that person to the world and then you get to find people that really, really love that person. Um, and that's and, important. And you know what? Um, then all these other people around you that you're affecting because you just tell them you're autistic, then they go, I think I might be autistic. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, you, you're like a mobile, you know, you, one person moves and then the rest, just like Jessica said, you know, you thought, you found out okay I am actually autistic and then your whole family's like mm, actually hmm, yeah we're autistic too um and I found that in the workplace um and with friends um a lot of friends um that are artists that now have um been diagnosed as autistic which is really interesting okay so that comes on to more positive so we'll come back to that in a second oh um, sorry no 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 you're it's not after positive be negative no 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 <laughs> um Okay, so the other negative that I've got here is kind of linked to all of that, really, which is that people are potentially going to perceive you as a disease or disordered person. Um, and I think that plays into the potentially the people that you will, will confront you and say, well, you don't look autistic and so on and so forth and potentially treat you differently. Um, I think did I, I sort of mentioned in I about being infantilized, which is quite frustrating and angering and what have you um because like I say sort of halfway through my PhD um I got di diagnosed so it's like people were treating me before that as the way I'd always been treated which is cold standoffish unapproachable but very uh intelligent and capable of doing my you know academic work and all that kind of thing and then I definitely noticed afterwards people talking to me as if I was a child um, and things like it wasn't a large number of people which I'm grateful for but it was annoying it was it was just what are you doing you know why are you talking to me differently I wanted you to understand it was it was more I wanted them to understand why they thought I was cold and standoffish and approachable it wasn't that I wanted them to suddenly think that I was no longer capable of things mm. I'd always been doing anyway um any other potential pitfalls for disclosing i know that a number of people have um not potentially us but have talked about losing jobs for instance by disclosing mm. um even when they've done the job really well and and uh, and everything and and, and people's uh, it just changes people's perspective of you or it can do yeah i think um for quite a while when you're first disclosing to people it does make you a lot more anxious and possibly depressed and things than usual because of all of those things but also just from maybe feeling unsure in yourself and like i said when i was first disclosing that i was autistic i still kind of thought it was a joke i kind of thought it was more imposter syndrome and like i was letting myself get away with um not being social or not trying mm. or that kind of thing and it did make me feel worse about myself until I'd sort of ridden that wave. And after that, it was completely fine and I've been better than ever. But there is that that low point um, if you're just quite unsure of yourself, I think, because you're changing the world so drastically. And I um, think that's also what's upsetting is your, you have 
as later diagnosed autistic people or even people who've been diagnosed as children and then then trying to understand their autistic identity as an adult which is also the sorts of people Annette and I work with and support which is they were diagnosed as children that they still don't know what being autistic means for them for instance is you have spent a lot of time working out if you're autistic you mm. have also spent time going I'm probably not am I uh, I'm not like that stereotype so I can't be we have spent time in autistic groups we have spent time with um, therapists or um, getting diagnosed if we do go through the diagnosis mm. process we have spent a lot of time working out if we're autistic or not and also having that doubt so then to have somebody who potentially has literally just met you to say you mm. don't look autistic or why do you think you're autistic you can't be etc yeah. is a slap in the face when you have spent yeah. so much time working it out I yeah. think. and just to be able to tell someone you know i'm autistic um is so much and um, i think um part of what hurts with it is um they think they're doing a positive thing by saying you don't look autistic. Yeah, because you're not and, really, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you've opened like your entire soul to them just by saying <laughs> I'm autistic. You've kind of shown them who you are and they're like, nah, you're good. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> and that's a good bit, that's an important point as well, that you're trusting that person in front of you with an important, incredibly important piece of information about you. And they're just, again, throwing it back at you. And so can we now bring it, I do want to go to positive disclosing, but I want to bring it back to dis, the similarities to disclosing your gender and sexual identities. I don't mean you specifically per se. One, yeah. one's talking, gender. Yeah, one's um, sexual, um, <laughs> uh, sexuality or gender identity. So can you explain the, the um, sort of similarities? If you're um, disclosing and when you're disclosing. <laughs> Jessica. you can go go ahead Jessica, Jessica. <laughs> the, the main one I would say is the one I tell people um is that people think that once you've disclosed that's it like you're out um it's never the case you're coming out over and over and over and over again and it might get easier but I'd say at least for a year it's not any easier um no matter how many times you say like I'm gay I'm bi I'm autistic right. you get the same responses and it's just more you've heard all those responses before so it seems okay and unless you're going to a new place and like I said with being autistic I kind of put it out as an outright fact as if they're sort of stupid for not knowing um with people you already know every single person you already know you're going to have to come out to and I found mm. that very similar um with being pansexual as well as being autistic yeah definitely um I think how is it so it's similar and so, it's similar in so many different ways for me I think in in some ways it's that kind of bearing of your soul to people you know mm. when I came out as being bisexual I had struggled with it for years um and I had people say like no you're not you're just trying to be like me I mean I had one boyfriend who was bisexual and I said well I think I might be as well and he says no you're not you're just trying to be like me you know just completely just, you know, you're bearing your soul to somebody and then they're like just dismissing, basically slapping it away. Um, and that felt very similar to the way that people respond a lot of times to when you come out as being autistic. Mm. Um, I guess the struggle as well, the kind of inner turmoil that I went through, yeah. um, the imposter syndrome of like, am I, am I not, am I, am I not, am I, am I not, you know, and feeling guilty um telling people autistic oh no I'm just actually I'm lazy that's why you know uh, I, I really responded to what you were saying Jessica about mm. oh well it's just you know I, I, you know pretending that you're autistic because but actually you're just lazy and that you're not actually autistic mm. um and that took me years I think about uh, for me not to question that I was autistic took me about I would say six years I'm you know I know I'm completely after di being formally diagnosed to say no I am autistic um you know and, and I think for me also being bisexual 
um, that took a long time as well for me to be like, no, I actually am. Um, mm-hmm. I, and, and, you know, whether that has to do with self-esteem, whether that, you know, um, to a certain extent, but when somebody th- slaps you in the face and says, no, you're not, <laughs> it's not very helpful. Um, and I think given that gender identity, sexual identity and autistic identity are all stigmatized. Yeah. And we are yeah. being, and I want this to be clear to all of you out there, whenever you disclose in whatever capacity, even if it's just, just one person, you are being strong and yeah. you are being brave. And that the person on the receiving end needs to be respectful of how much that's taken for you to disclose that to that person. Because we're not just talking about, I don't know, the town you come from or yeah. along those lines. We're talking about something that potentially is a very stigmatized identity. So we're not doing it, we're not disclosing that we're autistic and we're and and, and we're not actually autistic. Like why would we do that when it is such mm. a um a difficult experience to be understood by other people in a positive way if they don't already know autistic people and so on and so forth so I think people on the receiving end need to be much more respectful of when we're telling them I think uh also you know I I I identify now as she they um I think I I identify as non-binary and I, I, I wonder, you know, if I'd had the opportunity to do that in my 20s, there was no such thing as that back then. Um, if I would have been able, I would have done that as well. Um, and I think that is also another thing that, that can be quite difficult to, um, you know, you go back and forth about it. Am I, am I not, am I not, am I not? Um, <laughs> and I think, or maybe not, not everybody is. I think some people just go, no, I am. Um, but I, I really had a struggle. Um, uh, lots of inner turmoil about it. I'm trying to think about like the first time I went to gay pride as well um, and how amazing that was um, to be around all these people and to realize that I was, I, it was okay for me to be me there. Um, and I felt very similar when I, I was around an autistic community for the first time. It was that kind of amazing re- revelation and celebration that actually who I was was celebrated in this space. Um, and that space was very different than um, the day-to-day um, space in the world. And I think something so this leads into the positives of disclosing. So what you just said, which is, you know, back in your day, that there was no non-binary, for instance, and so on and so forth. And so then this leads on to some of the important things for disclosing. And these are some, some the one that I'm about to mention, this is a very personal, you need to make that decision for yourself because not everybody should have to be a role model and should have to feel like they have to be an advocate you're allowed to be your autistic self in whatever capacity that is but the importance is the more of us that disclose who are openly autistic because we can because we are safe and that might mean that it's a privileged few um, and we will keep fighting for it to be safer as much as we can but without us who do feel that we can disclose openly that we're autistic there's going to, you know, we can help others by getting them to identify and go, ah, I'm really similar to that person because they're not like the stereotype. Um, mm. Because the three of us, although we're AFAB, so um, assigned female at birth, um, we're very different autistic people, you know, and it's important to see that. And there'll be, there needs to be obviously much more representation because again, we are three white women or AFAB. Um, and so it's, you know, so the importance of as many autistic people who can comfortably and safely be open means we will help other autistic people realise they're autistic. And we'll also start to break down those autistic stereotypes. 
Um, so that's kind of like the big, big picture. And now I'm just thinking about the more other positives of disclosing. Why are you being so cute, Jessica? What's up, Jessica? <laughs> oh, because the cat. He's so cute. He's adorable. Sorry, you can you continue. <laughs> oh, somebody did ask earlier on that you had to explain and like show the cat. So this is Ted. They did, yeah. This is Ted. He's a Bengal. He's massive. He's a bit grumpy. <laughs> he grumpy. His face is amazing right now. <laughs> so cute. Um, okay. Anyway, yes. so yeah, other positives <laughs> of disclosing that might be closer to home for you as an individual. So I think it's quite clear that it also means we do find one another. Um, yeah. and, and a few people, I'm, I'm not really paying too much attention to the comments because there's quite a few and there's a lot of silliness from, from the typical people who would be silly in the comment section, <laughs> which is lovely. <laughs> it's still their community. That's how yeah. they want to engage in the community, which is lovely. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about finding others and finding that autistic community. And without being open, we can't find one another um, yeah. and, and find those spaces or create those spaces, which is really important. Um, one other thing I just think for me it's important because I can to be a role model hopefully for the next generation you know to make sure that they know that I'm autistic and that you know if they can identify with me or they can say well she did this you know she did a PhD um, or she's an artist and I can be an artist um, I think is really important to me because I, I don't want and I don't think that's going to happen now I mean it's it's been you know, you know, I was diagnosed in 2011, it's 2020, and it, it's changed so much, you know, I don't think the next generation of autistic people are going to have to wait till they're 40 years old um, to discover that they're autistic. Um, I hope not, um, you know, but I will work tirelessly to stop that from <laughs> and, being and the again, case. That's, and that's, again, the important thing is that you have completely put yourself out there because of obviously doing like the super auti gang and I always come back to one of the lovely um students that we know who is uh male and he'd never been able to find he he's autistic diagnosed autistic as well um and he'd never really seen any representation of himself anywhere and then we did the show and he was so emotional at the end because that was something he connected with and he'd seen himself in us as a group on on the stage you know yeah. um so yeah and and that's how we can reach people and and it's helping them either identify that they're autistic or even just validate their feelings that they're autistic because of that imposter syndrome and things like that um okay so because we get we've got nine so just a little bit a little bit more before we end um, would you expect all three of us to be together and keep to time for me? <laughs> <laughs> of course not it's a lovely conversation though. um but other positives of disclosing so yeah we've obviously described that it potentially will be difficult it depends on your employer if you are employed for instance um you may find it difficult in your workplace they may treat you differently but it also means that disclosing your autistic identity means that you are classed even if we don't necessarily feel it or agree with it we are classed as disabled in the UK and that we are protected under the Equality Act of 2010 um, so that means that you know you are uh, entitled to be accommodated for your neurology in that exactly um, and well that's just happened to you hasn't it Chloe you, I was going to um, give my example without yeah. too example because I you know I, I really like I work for a, a number of roles not all of them at Kent and um, I, I've been for several years marking at another university um, every year on several different um, assignments so different you know all different topics and subjects and things I've been doing that for years um, and I'm always asked back and um, this year they're management like not not the people I actually work with per se but the management decided that all marking was going to be um 
uh, vocalized, so orally recorded only. So it's very bizarre. If you haven't been to a university or you don't go to university that has this method, feedback is given via um, a system called Turnitin and there's like a feedback option for markers. And usually what we do is in-text comments so we can give you some tips. And then you've got written feedback down the side to give you very specific, this is what you did really well, this might need some work. And you know, we do a shit sandwich. Um, good, bad, good, right? Um, and there's always been an option to record and record a response to your student. None of us, I've never known any marker to use it. It's bizarre in itself. Yeah. Anyway. But we've been told that that is the blanket. There's no written feedback whatsoever. It's only orally called, recorded. And I said, I cannot do that as an autistic person. Um, and I gave you know, important reasons, which is that I'm not always able to articulate myself. And sometimes um, I think on some of the lives here, I've struggled to get my words out. And Harry said the other day, what does he call it? Vocal, vocal shutdown? Because mm. I don't experience situational mutism, which some autistic people do, but I do experience vocal shutdown, which is where I've got the words in my head, but I'm so cognitively exhausted the words won't come out my mouth. So I said, there's going to be times when I'm marking these essays where I am tired or I've had so many meetings or done so much work that I can still respond and give feedback, written feedback, but I cannot give oral feedback. And then that wouldn't be fair to the students because there'd be one student who would get quite articulate feedback and another student who wouldn't and then that's extra stress for me I said it's also disadvantaging me because I have to script I largely need to script conversations in my head or presentations and things like that quite a lot because I'm not very good at um, improvisation like Annette is um, and so I would still have to write out my feedback to then be able to read it back and orally um, like vocalize it for the recording so I said this is a disability issue and I was initially told well that's that's the rule that's it so I said that's really unfortunate I won't be marking then um, please consider me in the future if you change this decision um, you know and just saying that they needed potentially some neurodiversity training and things like this and that I mean the, the people I actually worked with are lovely so like I say it's not them it's like the higher ups as it were but they did come back and say you can use written feedback mm. um i would hope that's because they identified that that wasn't appropriate for an autistic person and i would like to think it wasn't because they were worried that it was a disability equality act issue i'd rather they were being kind and human and realizing that it's not appropriate so there are the potentials for yeah. good from disclosing in that way yeah i mean i think i worked as a lecturer in a college for nine years and I do think they treated me differently when I I came out as autistic um some people and some not but to a certain extent as well I realized that the job was not there was no way I could continue to do that job I suppose because it was so taxing sensorily um being in a room with 40 you know teenagers um, five days a week, eight hours a day was just too much for me. Um, so to some extent, I cha I've changed my career. Um, to suit and I think, neurology. yeah, yeah, to suit my neurology. I think ultimately working for myself or, or you know, a, a kind of part-time work or several jobs um, works better for me. And I so. think those of us that are able to work um and and that's not you know there's no judgment or anything on those who are potentially not able to um for for whatever reason but i think those of us that are able to we do seem or not always but to to create our own way of working and means of working so i'm the same you know i worked for customer services since i was 17 until i got my phd funding and that was not the place for me. And it, it, it made me ill um, psychologically. It was really distressing and stuff to be in that place. So um, we make the things, you know, Annette and I 
and Jessica and Harry. We are in, we are creating Academy and the work that we're doing with and outside of Academy, but sort of all interconnected because they're the things that we are good at, that we have strength in and that we know suits our neurology. So we're going to be working on, you know, research funding for our support program so we can help more and more autistic people as much as possible. Jessica has been working as Harry's PA for quite a few months now. Mm. And that has been kind of ideal for you because it's, you don't have to go into an office. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's actually been my first job that I've had in about five years because when I didn't know I was autistic I got scared out of work if that makes sense I spent six months or five months at each job and I couldn't do it um they were only part-time jobs because obviously I was still in education but I really couldn't and then even when Chloe and Harry approached me about um being Harry's PA I was really nervous about it wasn't I because I'd never I always thought I was just a crap worker but um no it's just I'm autistic and (laughs) this is the first time that my employers have known I'm autistic and it's it's been amazing yeah yeah, because you can work from bed and you can work via it's, text. It's lovely, yeah. Talk to anyone <laughs> like face to face or anything like that. People um, in the comments know that I'll be replying to their emails at like midnight. I'm yeah, my working hours. <laughs> A know? lot of, and I had the similar experience, Jessica. I had so many jobs that I had to quit because I just, after a certain amount of time, either I'd taken on too much and then been like, ah, oh, I don't, you know, I just, I, it was always, overwhelming or I would lose a job um you know I I think that happens to a lot of autistic people that you know it, especially if you're late diagnosed or you don't even know you're autistic you know you mm. go through this series of jobs that you kind of end up having to leave over and over and over again and you don't understand why like you said you think you're just crap at work <laughs> you just mask so that you look up like you're like an ideal employee like I did for years oh yeah and yeah periodically would just have to have so much time off yeah just kill yourself yeah, basically just, yeah it, it was it, I just couldn't do it not not for and it just gave me no meaning I need meaning in my life to get up in the morning I need to know that I'm doing something for me that means something um and things okay so because we need to finish soon um Oh, yes. So, so my I can last, go on and on. <laughs> well, I'm just picking up some of the key things in between the silly conversations that are happening. I love that they're still actually like learning and listening, but they like to um, play around with each other. It does make me laugh. Um, so picking up on things like the difficulty demasking, I've noted. And then I already had a note about the importance of being your authentic self. Um, so there's a number of things there that Annette and I, for instance, are... Uh, aware of so when we do our um support our structured support program the session we did today with our students was on masking and they're asked before they come in um i say come in it's online um they're asked before they turn up you know well they're given a week to think about what is your masked self like what is your non-autistic neurotypical presentation to the world and what is your autistic self like and they all always struggle to know what their masked self is and what their authentic autistic self is and we know this it's not like we're being mean or anything like that we're just trying to get them to start thinking Um, and then we actually I don't know if Kieran's still here potentially he's not but Kieran we use your checklist um, if anyone's interested potentially I think Kieran could um, uh, I think I've actually got it it potentially is in our notes section so have a check if I put it in there for people but Kieran's checklist which are indicators of your mask so I think demask is Demasking is going to be difficult for a number of reasons. It's going to be difficult if you don't know what your mask is or what your authentic autistic self is. Now, I like Kieran's point, which is that the mask is still you to a large extent. So there's not like a lot of autistic people might be scared that there's no real them underneath, that there's no real personality, but there is because the mask is still built from you. Um, So yeah, there's going to be the difficulty knowing what your mask is and then the um, fear, I guess, of demasking. And then where do you start to do that? Yeah, I think there is a similarity. Another similarity between coming out as autistic and coming out as gay is also you mask as, a, as, as um, a, somebody who is queer. So, you know, you say, oh yeah, my boyfriend, when you're actually talking about your girlfriend, you know, you might 
you know, not wear a certain item of clothing or, you know, act in different ways. So I, I think that that is another, I just thought of that now that, you know, masking is very much something that, you know, you do um, as a part of the LGBTQ community as well. Um, sorry. Well, I think the answer to all three of those things, or I would argue, so learning what your mask self looks like, be, where are you going to demask and how do you get to be your authentic self? I think they were my main three ones. I think so. Um, would be finding an autistic space. So if that's online, mm. if that's um, any small social groups or anything like that online, where ideally you do want to be able to see uh, the other autistic people or at least um, have a reciprocal communication with whether that's through chat, because obviously we don't have to use audio or camera. Um, I think that's probably key to working out what your mask self is Definitely. like. Definitely. You'll be around other autistic people and they'll be discussing their experiences and you'll go, oh, yeah, I do that. And oh yeah, is that autistic? Oh wow, I thought that was just me. Yeah, and I mean that is the best feeling when you, you know, you see bits of yourself and other people for the first time. And there's and sometimes it doesn't happen. You will see bits of yourself. So obviously, I definitely can connect with both of you because we are autistic. So there are similarities. And got distracted because he just called out my dinner is ready um <laughs> go ahead no 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 not because i need the dinner just because i was Hi. like oh no in my brain yeah no i heard it um oh no anyone Did know you? what i'm saying Train of thought. oh, what oh you saying? But sometimes oh. but then it is really interesting you need to meet and when i again when i say meet it might be online or what have you have you or even just watching people on ted talks or vlogs or anything like that but you need to meet as many other autistic people as possible just because also we're great but hmm. um to be able to also find yourself almost um so in in the you know the few years i think that some of the people that i'm like oh that's very similar to me or i can yeah. see myself there has been like kate fox sonia Bue. i'm sorry if i'm pronouncing your name incorrectly sonia i probably always do um and one of the students that we have at the moment there's some similarities and it's kind of it's like oh you know i'm i'm not alone i'm not even within you know connecting within autistic people uh, uh, with other autistic people in the community um so yeah you can figure out your mask in autistic spaces you can drop the mask more so in autistic spaces because we will encourage it we will encourage yeah. all the wonderful autistic things that you do so um and i've, I've i asked permission from um, one of the students that we had a few um session a few support programs back who you both know um who we encouraged when they liked putting objects on their head um and they were doing it really small objects because they didn't want people to really pay attention even in an autistic space and i was like oh what are we doing what is this this is lovely and you know encouraging it and and then eventually it got really really big and it's just like every time they put the object on it was hat and it's like oh my god i love it it's great it's such a lovely autistic thing that you're doing um and one of the other things yeah. that Love, oh. Sorry, oh, sorry, just like, my final thought. One of the other lovely things that we've started doing, um, because Annette and I already do it for our um, structure support program, is, and, and now I've said I'm going to say it, and now I'm going to get un inundated, aren't I? Um, is that we send out certificates that say, Congratulations um, on your autistic discovery, welcome to the autistic community, because yeah, that's okay. how it should be when you disclose your autistic. Um, yeah, that was yeah I think. The celebration of all the autistic things that you do is such a, a a surprising thing when you're in autistic space you know for someone to go oh look at you're you're swaying a bit back and forth you're autistic that's so cool where most of your life if you've done anything autistic you've been teased prodded reminded constantly of your difference um, and to actually be in a space where your act your difference is celebrated is a completely different experience. Um, and it takes some getting used to it. First, you're like, oh God, are people gonna, you know, well, I don't wanna be too autistic here because people notice. But and actually in the time. end, it does take time. It takes time for people who come into those spaces to stop apologizing yeah. for their mode of communication. Um, Cause somebody just put in here, um, I saw somebody mentioned that Dropping the mask is hard because being told you're repeating yourself and some people get bored. Now, is that in an autistic space? Because even if I'm not interested in your particular topic that you always want to discuss, 
because of your passion about talking about it, I will listen and I will be interested, right? And that is an amazing thing to see. Like I said, we, we, we've joked about this before where, you know, NT people want to social, um, socially interact by discussing really uh, um, superficially the weather. Whereas if an autistic person comes in and starts talking about the weather is in, you know, the science of the weather, we're like, oh, yeah, and if you're pattern. interested, you're going to learn something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's something, you're going to yeah, learn something exactly. in the conversation. You're gaining something. You're not just talking about something that completely doesn't matter. So, yeah, I've definitely had lots of those conversations about various, like, specialisations and stuff. But I've learned something, so it was it was good anyway. So any yeah. final thoughts from Jessica and then Annette on demasking and disclosing one's autistic identity? Oh, no. Jessica. Final thoughts? But I got uh, yeah. a really good time final thought. No, I thought of it. Um, it's because I said um, that actually when you are demasking, it can be the most anxiety inducing time that you've ever been through. But I would describe it as, um, and so like losing friends and things, my baseline of happiness was like down here. And you know, when you see your non-autistic friends, it like blips up a little bit and it goes back down. And you think that you have to put up with those situations to get that little blip of happiness. But as soon as I accepted that I was autistic and dropped the mask, my happiness was already up there. And so as soon, like, um, going to see a auty friend, it goes up even more. I'm already up that top. I don't need um, my old masking self to feel happy anymore. It just takes time um, to realise that. And it really does up and up. So that's my final thought. I think it's very, very difficult to demask without an autistic community around you. And that could just be one or two other autistic people that accept you for who you are. But to do it by yourself is, is incredibly, incredibly difficult. And I think, you know, that's why I just want to make like millions of little autistic communities all over the world because Scoop you know everyone. autistic people should not be isolated and alone and why we can't do this on our on our own you know you you need other autistic people to to just be yourself with um i think that's just so incredibly important it's almost impossible um to do this in isolation i think you know, even if it's just online, even if it's just for a half an hour a week, you know, try to, to be with, you know, other autistic people. Um, because and we it, do it see a difference become... in students um, who potentially only ever talk to other autistic people for two hours a week. You see a difference that sometimes is enough to improve that, that person's well-being somewhat. Okay, so I think my final final point is bringing all of this together which is everything that academy is currently discussing everything annette and i and jessica and harry are always discussing at the moment which is the importance of positive autistic identity culture community and space so when we say space again that could be online offline when we finally get offline at any point um all these things then you can work on all these things together you can discuss yeah. the issues of masking and demasking although then that would make potentially us on here obsolete oh no no <laughs> back we only us. exist on the computer you know like how teachers Never. live in the cupboard we just live in this little box it's fine <laughs> so thank you everybody so much for being here and you two on here um um yes we have been all academy and we also have another session on disclosing one's autistic identity tomorrow with Harry and um, Carl Cameron, who wrote a chapter on this specific subject in the Neurodiversity Reader. Um, so yeah, this was an important topic. So we've got two sessions on it, you lucky, lucky lot. So thank you so much, everybody. Night, night. I'm gonna go have my dinner. Bye. Bye.